Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Samuel! Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are talking about the Gospels. This is Gospels part 112. Last week we saw where the disciples were pointing out to Jesus about the many buildings and beauties and intricacies of the temple and Jesus hits them with a truth bomb that pretty soon there's going to be a day where not one of those stones are going to be standing and they're all going to be thrown down and um, and then the disciples ask him like when is this going to happen like the sign of the com- of your coming in the end of the age and then we had this long discourse of Jesus showing these kind of prophetic images um, from things like people coming, saying that they are the Christ, leading many astray, hearing about wars, rumors of wars, a nation rising up against a nation, famines, earthquakes, and many people in the evangelical church want to interpret that as a like uh, end times, like it, it hasn't happened yet, but Jesus was arguing, we were arguing that Jesus was saying that these are all prophetic images that the disciples are going to see leading up to the destruction of the temple itself in 70 AD, Yeah, which I know is a hard pill to swallow, but narratively we think that it makes much more sense than it being something that still has not happened yet. Yeah, and I think as we begin this next section, it's going to... It's too bad we had to cut the podcast when we did last time, but this, I think, is going to help sort of solidify that. Now, unless you think Jesus is just bouncing back and forth and, you know, in one sentence he's talking about the end and the next sentence he's talking about the temple and he's got it all jumbled up, which that doesn't sound like a very good way to communicate, especially if you're a guy trying to write it down and communicate it later, you, you'd you probably at least try to keep topics together or whatever. So we're going to begin in, let's see, we got Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 to 22, and this parallels Mark chapter 13, verses 14 through 20, and Luke chapter 21, verses 20 to 24. Now I'm going to read Matthew because he's going to end up being our main source of text for, for quite some time, but I, I also want to bring in Luke on this one because it adds... It adds a little bit that's helpful, but let's go ahead and read it and then we'll talk. So Matthew 24, 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. All right. Uh, Now, okay, I said I was going to read from Luke. Let me do that, too, so that we can get, you know, a slightly different look, uh, (laughs) especially the way he starts. So here it goes. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are inside the city depart 
and let not those who are out in the country enter it, for these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Okay, now, as we have said before, we, we can read this and we can hear what other people hear. We, we hear how, hey man, boy, some of that sure sounds like the end times. But I would like to suggest that the reason that it does is because so many people speak of the end times in this language. In fact, so many people speak of these specific scriptures as the end times that a lot of that, it, it makes its way into our thinking and it's very easy to make that logical leap or to make that connection. But pay very close attention to the very, very first parts of these, okay? We are still answering the first question. When will the temple and Jerusalem be destroyed? But listen, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, Samuel, where is the one and only place that is called the holy place in Judaism, Jerusalem, temple, etc., etc.? Where, where is that? Um, like the holy of holies in the temple or the tabernacle? Yeah, it's got to be inside the temple. That's what Matthew is talking about right at that moment. Listen to what Luke says. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, let those in Judea flee to the mountains. Those who are inside the city depart and let those who are not inside the city, okay, don't enter it. It's very, very clear right at this moment that Jesus has been talking about the temple and Jerusalem. He is still talking about the temple and Jerusalem. So I, I, I want to focus on a couple of things here. First of all, that phrase, abomination of desolation, okay? My goodness, this has been, so many people or things have been blamed as being this abomination of desolation. And sadly, some people call it the Jews or the Jews continuing sacrificing or stuff like this. I, can I just say this very simply? That's not it. Okay, it's probably easier understood by the phrase, the abomination that makes desolation or brings desolation or causes desolation, okay? Now, throughout Jewish history, even the history of the temple, there has been at least one, possibly more, depending on which scholar you're talking to, there's been one or more abominations of desolation. It's just something that's that's uh, really not supposed to be in the temple, but it isn't that the abomination itself is always the super bad thing. It, it's the desolation that results because of it. Okay. So anyway, let's go on. It, it, in Daniel, uh, and you can look at a few different places. There's chapter 9, verse 27, chapter 11, verse 31, chapter 12, verse 11. Okay. You go read about those, but it's commonly thought that, okay, if Daniel has a a real time component as well as a future component. Okay, the real time component is commonly thought to be the Greek king Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. Okay, and and most especially of those references, Daniel eleven thirty one. Now we can't sit here and tell you by all means it's absolutely true. We don't know. We weren't there, but that that's the common thinking, and it makes some sense. He, what did he do? Set up a statue of Zeus and he sacrificed pigs to Zeus in the temple. Now, Samuel, 
Can you imagine how we might, if we were Jewish, title that an abomination of desolation? Can you see it? Definitely. Yeah. So uh, that is one example. Now, as I mentioned, additionally, it's long been understood to have uh, a more future and and even an end times application. This This stuff we're seeing in Daniel, even though... We can look at it and say, man, that really looks like that was Zeus. Okay. It could also be a future time thing. And this is similar to the idea of the day of the Lord. Now, we may see more than one event across history labeled as day of the Lord. But there's also going to be a big final one. Well, that may also be a thing That is true about the abomination of desolation. There may be more than one across history, but there's going to be a big final one. Now, maybe that's not true. I don't know. I'm just, I'm trying to bring out, this is what scholars talk about. This is what they're trying to figure out. Why are they trying to figure it out? Because no one knows. So we're just trying to make the best image of all the information that we have. And so there's something for you to hear and hold on to. Now, Matthew, he speaks in, I think, more general terms. Some would say very general terms, whatever. One, you could easily understand Matthew to be speaking of either the coming destruction of the temple or the end of the age. Now, I think I think it, even Matthew definitely leans toward destruction of the temple and and fairly heavily leans that way but you know that's the one where it brings a little bit of confusion luke i think does us all a huge favor because he speaks in very specific terms about the destruction of the temple and jerusalem and by the way whatever luke's talking about it fits very well with what you see back in daniel 9 27 again do I know that that's an exact and perfect reference and that's exactly what Daniel meant? No, but it's a really good fit. So, what then is the abomination? Well, we've got a couple of things we could talk about, I guess. Caligula, he was a Roman leader, right? He almost <laughs> installed a statue of himself. This was this was going to happen, but he died. And so... Everybody who was like doing his bidding stopped doing his bidding. So that never, that never really came to be. So it, it would appear, and now, now this is where if you want to point back and go, oh, well, it was the Jews. Okay, I think there's a really bad and wrong sense that you could do that. But there's another sense in which you could, you could do that, and it actually really makes sense in the story. It kind of fulfills the story. And so we could say it this way. It might appear that the abomination is the unrepentant sin and rejection of Messiah. And now we know that that's a real thing, right? And that this is what brought about the desolation. And and what was the sign? Well, if, if you were using Luke's text, you could say, well, it's the armies surrounding the city. So let, let's let's review a lot of the events that are happening right here. So, You're going to have armies at the beginning. They're going to surround the city and the temple. They're, they're going to work their way in. So, so at some point you can, you can understand them as standing in the holy place, but in the beginning, they're just surrounding. And, and why do we care about the part where they're surrounding the city? Well, that's, that's your clue. That's when you see that you are supposed to flee to the mountains and you're supposed to act quickly before you're completely surrounded and can't get out. So don't waste any time on any of your stuff or whatever. You know what? Just go. Pregnant women or women who you've still got infants, man, this is especially bad for you. This is an especially vulnerable time because what? it's hard to move quickly. It's, it's a difficult journey. And Jesus even instructed them, those who are listening, you know what? You need to pray that when this comes, it doesn't happen in winter. Why? Well, the conditions are just harsher. It's harder to travel, all of that. Or pray that it doesn't happen on the Sabbath. 
Why? Because then you're going to be completely empty handed. Now, I know it said, hey, don't waste time going back in your house to get your cloak or whatever. All right. But you may have some things with you. If it's Sabbath, if, if you're really, you know, trying to flee the city and follow the Sabbath rules, I mean, you wouldn't even have money with you. It would be it would be even worse to have to travel on the Sabbath. And so he explains that there's going to be great tribulation, great distress upon the earth like has never been seen before. It's going to be an outpouring of wrath upon God's people. And and, and that's one of those where you go, man, I don't know. That sounds an awful lot like the end times. Yeah, it does. Nobody's saying that it doesn't sound like it. But we've talked about this how many times, the idea of hyperbole, the idea of of emphasizing something through hyperbole so you get the idea this is going to be really, really, really bad. And oh, by the way, out of all the things that happened to the city of Jerusalem and, and all of that, I mean, it's very reasonable for someone to look back and at, at this particular event and say, this was the worst one. This was, this was worse than all of the things that come before, even the exile and Babylon and all that. Now, does every single person, every single historian or scholar look at it that way? Okay, maybe not. But it's, it's reasonable to look at it that way. So it also could be quite literal. So that's going on. Uh, it says that, uh, well, it doesn't say it. Uh, we're we're kind of talking about what is in the text and also a little bit about what did happen. Many are going to be killed. Many are going to be captured. The temple, the entire city of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And, and, and interestingly, this is the times of the Gentiles. And l- notice what it said. Uh, this was in Luke, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. It's important you see that phrase because this is specifically not to be confused with the fullness of the Gentiles that Paul talks about in Romans 11.25. Completely different topic, so don't let your mind go there. This is only talking about Jerusalem being under the power of the Gentiles. And God is going to cut this short out of mercy. Do you remember Samuel when he, he said that all, uh, remember he was talking about how the, the prophet, uh, they had killed all the prophets and, and they had, had made their graves and, and all of the, all of the history, all the bad stuff of Israel was going to come upon this generation. You remember that? Mm-hmm. Well, here God's going to cut it short out of mercy. There will be those who get away, but without God's intervention, Israel, the people, Israel, it's possible they may have even ceased to be. We don't know because it didn't happen. But all of the history, all of the badness is coming upon this one generation. We talk about, gosh, that doesn't sound very fair. But, you know, we, we see how this all comes out. So this event, this event, it's a really big deal. And it's it, even though we might look at the language and think, gosh, I don't know. Sounds like end times. Well, it fits with this time also. Historically, this is amazingly accurate. This is what happened. And it's fa- in fact, it's actually clear that all of these warnings that Jesus is giving during this time, they were actually understood and heeded. The believers, or maybe you call them the remnant, whatever, they not only escaped, you know, early or in time, but some would say they actually thrived in the aftermath. Now, uh, I'm not, again, I'm not, I don't know how accurate this is, but tradition speaks of a great community of believers in Pella, a city called Pella. Now, some dispute that, but, you know, there's a lot that think, no, no, that's a, that's a real deal. That was a real thing. It, it seems to be related to this early escape. That's where many of them went. Uh, many other Jews also escaped or uh, were taken captive, meaning uh, 
in some sense, they, they got away. They just got away into a bad situation, right? <laughs> As opposed to those who were left in Jerusalem, their situation was horrible. Those that were left behind, Samuel, oh, it was bad. They suffered terribly. And we could go through a list much longer. I mean, things like dehydration and starvation, but also things like rape and murder and suicide. Uh, those trapped inside, there was cannibalism. I mean, th- there appears to be that we have writings and I don't know, some suggest we even have evidence of all these different things. I don't know. It sounds horrible. And for those who escaped, most of them were gutted because here's what the Romans were thinking. Hey, they're trying to get out of the city. They probably wanted to take all their stuff with them. They probably swallowed all of their gold and jewels. So they'd cut them open to see if they had anything sneaking inside, right? It was bad. This was bad. If you had lived through it, you might actually be thinking that this was the end times, right? You see what I'm saying? So the the atrocities that were committed, whether they were, you know, like Gentile on Jew from the Romans or whether they were Jew on Jew inside the city, people trying to somehow save their own lives at the expense of others, whatever, it's, it's horrible. In the years leading up to the siege. I mean, there were all kinds of this stuff that was going on, and that was all pretty bad. And and some, some would suggest that some of the things that the Jew on Jew did was even worse than anything that the Romans did to them. I don't know. It just, you know, again, depends on who you read, who you trust. But Samuel, this is a bad, bad time, and this is an amazing prediction. But again, this is answering the first question. How do we know the temp- or when will the temple in Jerusalem be destroyed, etc.? What's the sign? So, there's that. What do you got? Yeah, um, I just think it's really telling when we're coming upon passages like this and we're trying to use this interpretation that Jesus is referring to the destruction of the temple rather than end times because to me, it it speaks to Jesus' urgency of trying to prepare his disciples of what is about to happen to him, to them, and to their people group. Yeah. Basically within their lifetimes. Yeah. I'm not saying that he couldn't have talked about end times, but to me, it just, with how the events of this last week of Jesus' life are unfolding and things are, the drama is increasing the the time is running out yeah it just seems more pertinent for jesus to be dis- disclosing this in terms of like you need to know this because after i'm gone those 40 years are going to happen fast uh, and you you need to be aware of it compared to oh before i go let me tell you about you know thousands of years from now you know or even l- later than that of what's going to happen exactly so, I I just like that aspect of it. And there is some of the, and let me tell you about the future coming, for sure, because they asked two questions. But, yeah, I feel like the this last section, the one that we just completed, that is the one that really helps pull all of this first part together so that you can, oh, now I can see it. I do see how this could be related to the temple in Jerusalem. But we're going to keep going. This next bit, I think, well, it's it's the finish part. It's going to finish talking about the temple in Jerusalem, you know, that part of the, the, the first question. But it's also going to act as the segue into the second question. I, it's hard to decide, should I, should I have included it here or in the next part or whatever? But y- you'll see what I did and maybe why I did it, whatever. But let's go on. We're in Matthew chapter 24. This is verses 23 through 28, and uh, there's a parallel in the book of Mark, chapter 13, verses 21 to 23, but it's pretty short. We're not going to bother reading that. We're just going to do Matthew. Here we go. Then, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, 
if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So, if they say to you, Look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, Look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For, as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Now, after all that we've said, just reading that, you may have actually heard how he seems to be transitioning to, okay, wait a second. He, he's still talking about, I don't know, reasonably soon to come kind of future. And yet he's relating that now to, and, and then his second coming, it's, it's going to be different. You're not going to have to wonder, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, let's see what we got here. I think we're still like concluding now the answer to the first question, when will the temple in Jerusalem be destroyed kind of thing. Um, but this this is an amazing inclusion, and and it, it should... I, do you remember when we brought up that question about that verse in Zechariah, Samuel? Maybe they were thinking that was going to be... Because it, it, sh- it seemed to show not only did the temple get destroyed, but then immediately the Son of Man, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. This might have helped uh, them you know, disregard those thoughts or maybe not disregard them, but, but maybe hold them a little more loosely knowing that, Hey, this couldn't be quite exactly the way it appears to read in Zechariah or whatever. Jesus is telling them very specifically, he will not be back when this desolation occurs. That's the important bit. You, you may see false Christ, false prophets, whatever. It isn't going to be me. So, so this desolation that he's been telling them about, all this bad stuff, you may look around and you may think I'm a coming, maybe because of what you remember from Zechariah, but I got news for you. It ain't going to be me. I'm not coming back then. He's warning them and, and even them, right? His, his apostles, his disciples, not to be led astray by this stuff. He's telling them that he, he's already told them all they need to know to navigate or to survive this coming tribulation. So this is important because although we see a lot of language that makes it appear like it's expected to come soon and all those things, this much Jesus does seem to know. There's going to be this tribulation. There's going to be this destruction. All this is going to happen. I'm not coming back then. Now, they may see... And here, some amazing uh, false messiahs and some false prophets. And these things happened. There's a little bit of it in that 40-year period leading up to the temple being destroyed. And there was a fair bit of it that occurred after that time also. So it's kind of hard to tell. Is, you know, is Jesus maybe reaching out a little bit beyond the destruction temple, whatever? Not sure. These guys, they may even do some great signs and wonders. We have some writings that seem to suggest that those kind of things happen. Jesus tells them, don't believe these people. Don't, don't. And it's easy to not believe them. Now, on one hand, I'm sure this has to be a little bit scary. I mean, you know, they're being warned by Jesus, don't be led astray. And so some part of them has got to be going, man, could it be me? Could I be led astray? Right? You know, it's a little scary. How can I know? On one hand, I won't be too skeptical and then miss the real thing when it happens. Right? So now remember uh, these gospels, and it, again, it depends on who you believe, which which historians or scholars or whatever you trust, whatever. These gospels are likely written, not John's. We know probably not John's, but, but these first three uh, possibly and maybe even likely written before the destruction of the temple. So they're still they're still not quite sure of everything that's going on. Now, verses 27 and 28, once we get down to the end of this thing, when he says, for as the lightning comes from the east, it accomplishes two things. First, it explains that Jesus' return, as I mentioned, 
it's not going to be mistakable. You're not going to confuse his return for anything else. So on one hand, phew, good thing, right? Number two, it acts as kind of like the official segue into answering the second question. The second question was, what will be the sign of Jesus' return and the sign of the end of the age? So as far as that first one, you know, the part about it being unmistakable. Okay, I mean, there's some practical things we can see. Samuel, lightning. What, what do we know about lightning? If you were standing outside, let's, let's make the easy example. You're outside, it's in the dark, and then all of a sudden there's lightning. What, what are some things you could say about it? Um, it happens very quickly, and it's, you can't miss it when it's in the sky. You can, <laughs> it illuminates the entire horizon. Yeah, it's almost like for that very, very, very brief moment, it overwhelms everything. And, and it comes out of nowhere. It's just, it's a flash. It's really, really bright. And now, uh, side note, even if the flash and everything else wasn't enough, let's also note it's followed by thunder. So even if you somehow miraculously missed the flash, well, you're not going to miss the thunder, right? You can feel it. You can hear it. Right? Uh, so I don't know. There, there's that kind of stuff. And it can be seen for great distances. And so from our own personal perspective, from we're just standing and we see lightning, in a sense, it feels as if it's everywhere. It, I mean, who knows how far that lightning can be seen from our perspective, right? And so the point of this imagery is that Christ's return, it's going to be sudden. It's going to be unexpected. It's going to be clear and obvious and unmistakable unmissable, you're not going to wonder. It will be as obvious as, and then there's a very plain, practical human example. We know this by living. It's going to be as obvious as when you see vultures circling or gathering. What, is, what do you think, Samuel, when you see vultures circling? <laughs> something is dead nearby. <laughs> yeah, something's dead. You don't know what, you don't know exactly where, but it's an obvious, clear sign. It's unmistakable. Now, interestingly, though, we see the word vulture in our English translations. There are some who think that it should be translated as eagle instead of vulture. And why do they think that? Because eagle was a symbol of the Roman Empire. So when you see the the eagle circling and gathering. It's as if he's referring back to when he said, what well, Luke said, surrounded, the city will be surrounded by armies, uh, which again would, would lead us to, uh, that would actually lead us back to the destruction of the temple, which I don't think actually fits here now because what he's trying to do is contrast everything that he has just talked about with, okay, and now now that you've heard about all that, now I'm going to tell you what the actual end end is going to be like, right? So I don't think that that fits here. It's just interesting that, that in the one place we feel the, the text transitioning from the temple to the end times, there are others who are trying to bring it back to the temple. So <laughs> whatever, uh, we're going to go with vultures. I'm just going to, we're going to mark that one with a big maybe. And we might also uh, kind of enjoy a cool connection with, uh, let's see, there's a number of places there's a period. There's Job chapter 39, verse 30, Ezekiel chapter 39, uh, verses 17 to 24, Luke chapter 17, verse 37, Revelation 19, uh, verses 17 and 21. All of these are referring to a great banquet in the kingdom after Jesus' return and victory, except it's not actually referring to the banquet that that in theory we are going to enjoy, the one we want to be a part of. It, there's a similar banquet that's outside the kingdom, and that banquet is for the birds eating the flesh of his enemies, Jesus' enemies, God's enemies, right? Yeah, yeah, collective ouch on that one, <laughs> right? But when when you see that phrase... Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Many believe it's referring to 
that the language matches some of these other verses that we just listed off before you. So anyway, there's that. So the, now on to the, remember we said uh, verses 27, 28 accomplished two points. The second one was kind of a segue. And so that, that second question, the answer to the second question does seem to follow. And that's where we're headed next. So Samuel, what do you got? If anything, I just think it's really telling um, that Jesus is stating to them, revealing to them that he's not going to be back when this desolation occurs. Um, and I think it fits really well with what you have brought up previously with the disciples incorrectly thinking that, um, okay, the destruction of the temple is going to happen, but right after that, like, yay, like Messiah son of David like conquering the, king the conquering king is coming yep. and I think that even in this with Jesus saying like I'm not going to be there like maybe in some way fuels that misconception for the disciples um, which stinks uh, whenever it gets to that point because they're <laughs> you know e- even in some of the right. apostles writings like the the timeliness that they seem to be suggesting that Christ's return, second return, is imminent. And I just wonder if if yeah. some of that wasn't at play there. Yeah. Oh, I think possibly. And, and we're going to see as we continue on. Now, I know it's, in one sense, it's Matthew's language. In another sense, it's Jesus's language. But it, you're going to see that, that sense of uh, immediacy or or at least you know, really, really soonness, something, (laughs) it's still in there. And that's when Jesus also declares that, you know, here's the thing. Even I don't know. Mm -hmm. God's the only one who knows. And so Jesus seems to be, at the very least, open to this happening in what we would think of in terms of soon. And here it's been over 2,000 years. So it's kind of, kind of cool. But it's also cool that he's very specifically saying, hey, you know, the truth is, I don't know. I don't know. So anything else? No. All right. So from our perspective, we're saying there were two questions that were asked. He has now fully answered the first question, and now he's moving on to the second question. And and let's... Uh, whew, Let's get into this. Oh, well, look, it starts with the word immediately. So, <laughs> so let's see. Uh, let's see what he's got to say. We are reading in Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 to 31. And there are parallels in Mark chapter 13, verses 24 to 27. And Luke chapter 21, verses 25 to 28. All right. So I'm going to read Matthew. Here's what he's got. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Okay, now, just to be fair, Samuel does that also sound very much like the end times? Immediately, like right after. Well, yeah, I, I, okay, let's avoid the word immediately for a moment, but just all of those things, like the sun being darkened, the moon, and stars falling, in, and signs in the heavens, and, right? All of this, the, the angels and trumpets, does this have an end times kind of feel also? Oh, for sure. Yeah, and and... I know that the other sections, okay, it also kind of did, but but we were, you know, keeping that within the context of the temple. These are the real end times kinds of signs, the things that we should be looking for. So let, let, let's talk about everything that we're seeing in here. Okay, the question being answered is, what will be the sign of Jesus' return and the end 
of this age. And, and another way we could say that is when will be the start of the kingdom? Because th- they're going to happen r- like together or in immediate succession or whatever. And now remember, this is all because we're keying in on Matthew's more explicit text. So immediately. All right. This this is what we, we just talked about. It. Immediately. It's always a difficulty. And I don't know if you remember this, Samuel, when we were making fun of Mark's use of the word immediately. It's like we were reading through his gospel and he kept saying it over and over and over again. And it didn't take much to realize, okay, at a certain point, it's got to stop feeling like immediately as in, and then at the very next moment. He, he wasn't using the word that way. It, it wouldn't have made any sense. It, it, it would have been like watching a video on fast forward or something. It was kind of weird. He, he was using it more like, and then the next thing that happened, or the next thing I'm going to tell you about, that, that was more the sense in which he was using the word. Okay, So it could be that there's something similar at play here. It could be uh, that Matthew's writing this, you know, he, he didn't really think in his mind that these things were going to literally be happening at the very next moment. Or maybe he was. We don't know what was really in Matthew's head. But we do know that that isn't what happened. Now, it could also be that he's only trying to communicate that after the destruction of the temple, after the destruction of the city, you know, the next big thing will be the end, the second coming. Or maybe there, there's a... Well, let me say this. The timing in between the two, uh, the way it's spoken here, it's kind of left ambiguous. And it could be that the time in between these two happening, it could be the time that the kingdom grows. Do you remember we've had so many parables about the kingdom and how it's going to start small and spread, right? Remember all those, Samuel? Mm -hmm. So one other thing, you might look at this and it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, well... Now, he could be referring to the tribulation of those days before the temple gets destroyed or when the temple is destroyed, right? He could be referring to what he's just been talking about. It's also possible, because he's already transitioned, hey, the Son of Man, it's going to be like a flash of lightning, right? He could be talking about the tribulation of those days in the future, like the tribulation of the end, right? It, it could be that. So there's a lot of different ways to, to understand this word immediately, and it does cause trouble, but we're sticking with, okay, he's still talking about the real end times, though, and, and we're still saying it, it doesn't have to be this impossible thing to explain. What, you know, what do you mean? But anyway, Matthew, he's going to give us six more parables that are coming up, and, and those maybe not every single one, but you're going to see a theme running through them that it speaks of the delay in his return and the need to remain vigilant no matter how long the delay is. So, I mean, maybe Jesus expected it immediately, but he does, again, I know I'm reaching into the future text, but he does talk about later that he doesn't know. So I think it's a lot more reasonable to think that he's he has switched to talking about the future and probably this idea of immediately after the tribulation of those days, that's probably referring to a tribulation in the future, not the one that he's just been talking about. But, you know, I get it. This It's a hard one to, to read. But let's talk about what are we seeing here? What are all the things that he's saying are going to happen? Well, there are going to be some natural signs. You're going to see... Uh, the sun and moon darkened. You're going to see stars falling. By the way, that that's a, a highly recognizable reference. You you might look back at Isaiah chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, but you'll also, one that we might be more familiar with is in Revelation 6, verses 12 and 13. So you see that kind of thing happening. The powers of heaven, and in this case, I think... English words that we might use, the powers of heaven, we might think of spiritual governments. This is a 
And boy, it's a long story, but you go back even to the Tower of Babel when God uh, confuses language and sends people out, and he sets up 70 rulers, if you will, in the heaven de- heavenlies. That's why the nations, the Gentiles, are always referred to as the 70, okay? Th- so those spiritual governments are going to be shaken. It's a big deal. Signs in the heavens, those are that's an astronomical kind of thing. There will be signs in the heavens. The seas, uh, they're going to become scary and chaotic. I mean, we may look at them that way already, but it's going to be a lot worse. So all kinds of what we might think of as natural signs, signs in creation. Okay, sorry, not the spiritual governments, but whatever. You get the idea. Uh, Luke adds that as these signs begin, okay, part of the reason we're being told about them, we should not bend. We should not cower in fear. In fact, we should straighten up with courage because we know the redemption is near. It may be big and awesome and scary, but we also know that it represents good news. And so we should stand firm in the midst of it. And and he warns, you know, there people are going to faint with fear. It's going to be, you know, a big, scary deal. But again, we can have... Uh, I don't know, some sort of hope in the midst of it. It's a good thing. The whole earth will see the sign of the Son of Man. And that is, what are some other words we could use? His standard, his signal, his banner, you know, his flag, whatever. I mean, I don't think it's going to be a literal thing like that, but that's the, the word that's being used. That's his sign. It will be visible and it'll be accompanied by trumpet blasts. And of course, there's a cultural expectation in that. That is a call to war. So, uh, you know, so much going on here. Uh, Jesus is going to return on the clouds with power and glory. This is important because uh, now in the story, we haven't seen this yet, but Jesus is going to ascend to the Father on the clouds. And this, that's, you know, just like the Son of Man that we see back in Daniel 7, Jesus ascends to the Father on the clouds. Well, guess what? He's going to return on those clouds. So that's kind of a neat deal. And Jesus is going to send angels with more trumpet blasts to call and to gather the elect from everywhere like everywhere on the earth. And, and uh, you know, another reference you might look at back in Isaiah 27, 13, you see reference to that. But it's, it's from the four winds or from one end of heaven to the other or from the ends of the earth to the ends of the earth. These are all, I mean, I'm going to call them idiomatic phrases. Uh, some actually might call them hyperbole. That doesn't feel so good for me, but whatever. They're idiomatic phrases that are just trying to communicate that the gathering will be complete. No one who qualifies as elect is going to be missed. They will all be gathered together. And and I think I think it's reasonable for us to look ahead. The book of Revelation, this is also going to include the righteous who've already died. This represents the first resurrection. And I I say that like everybody knows. If you were to go read Revelation, it seems very, very, very clear that there are two resurrections. One for the righteous happens so that they can enjoy the kingdom. And then after the kingdom, the true judgment occurs. And that's the second resurrection. And every human who has ever lived will be resurrected if they haven't already. So now I have to ask this, Samuel, we talked about all that stuff that was going on at the time of the temple. Now we're talking about all this stuff that we're suggesting at the end times. Do you see how different all of this sounds? Definitely. Yeah, this is a crazy different scenario. Everything spoken of before can actually be seen in historical events. You may or may not agree with it, but but you can see it in there. Not this stuff. This stuff. Th- there's nothing in history that you can point to and go, oh, yeah, maybe it was just. Talk-. No, this is 
unseen stuff. It, this is stuff that's yet to come. It's speaking of a second time, a second set of events. Now, I do also need to take a, a little time here and say, look, verse 31, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, I've already talked about it. I've kind of explained it already the way I see it, but I need to say this expli- explicitly. Again, this is not talking about the rapture. This is referring to the in gathering. Now, this is an oft repeated prophecy of Scripture, this, this in gathering thing. And just some examples. Boy, you could look at Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 14 to 16, Isaiah 11, 11, Hosea 3, verses 4 and 5. Let's just read one. Samuel, read Ezekiel. I know it's kind of long, but let's do it anyway. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 24 to 28. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. One thing I heard uncleanliness is uncleannesses, which is a weird word. Uncleanliness yeah. makes more sense, but whatever. But but when you when you listen to that, when you were reading it, Samuel, you can really hear you uh, clearly see that this is some sort of in gathering, and you also heard uh, remove the heart of stone, give you heart of flesh, put my spirit within you. We can clearly see that this is at the fulfillment of the new covenant. The kingdom is is the partial fulfillment of that new covenant. The world to come is the ultimate fulfillment. And we even know that whole uh, writing the, the, the Torah on our minds and on our hearts, uh, that's a process that's being worked out in us, hopefully, but... You can see all of that in there. So when the kingdom begins, there's going to be an in gathering. This is a, again, I said it, it's an oft repeated prophecy of scripture. It's a thing. Tradition around the in gathering. Okay. Now, again, I don't know if this is true or false or, you know, whatever, but tradition around the in gathering even includes uh, something along the lines of what we think of as transportation, right? Uh, uh, there are a lot of people, if you were to read Acts chapter 8, verses 39 and 40 about Philip, a lot of people look at that and go, man, something miraculous and supernatural happened to Philip. It's like he was transported from one place to another. Some people don't see that, or some people disagree, whatever. But but this in-gathering, it it. it the the tradition includes that kind of idea. You will just be, uh, maybe you're just like, in one moment I'm here and the next moment I'm there, like on Star Trek or something, I don't know. Or other people see it as, no, you're, you're actually riding on the clouds from wherever you are to Jerusalem. And the reason that this is important, again, is it accurate, perfectly true? I don't know. But the reason it's important is because it feeds into other things that we know. And we know that Jesus is coming on the clouds. We just read that part. So uh, this is it's, it's, it's not about a rapture. It's about the in-gathering, and that's going to end up being important as we continue in the text later. So anyway, there's that, Samuel. What do you got? Yeah, another word I like to use for this transportation thing that you're talking about, the end gathering, is it's almost like a form of teleportation. Like right. God is moving uh, someone, like you said, Star Trek, uh, without that person covering the distance in between the the two locations. So I think that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I also wanted, this is, it's just a little detail, and we may have talked about it in the past, but um, this uh, the signs of the Son of Man coming, uh, you had said that 
his um, standard, his signal, his banner will be vis- visible and then accompanied by trumpet blasts. I know in rabbinic tradition, um, yeah. there is this idea of these two ultimate trumpets that came from the horns of the ram that Abraham sacrificed in place of Isaac on the mountain whenever God called Abraham to sacrifice his son, and he provided that ram instead. The first horn was set aside for the high priest who used during the festival of Rosh Hashanah, the year of the Jubilee. Uh, There's a blowing of the horn in that festival, but then the rabbis say that the second horn has been set aside to be waited uh, until the coming of Messiah uh, on the earth. And that trumpet that we're going to hear is going to be that second ram's horn being blown. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that story, it's it's so great because they even go to the detail of the one that they use at Rosh Hashanah. It's the smaller of the two horns. The bigger is the one that got set aside and will be used at the end. I love that. That's cool. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Anything else? No, it's just a lot to take in and process and wrestle with. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not usually the guy who's like a big fan of talking about eschatology and all that stuff because so much of it is it's just unknown. I mean, God hasn't told us all that we need to know. Or, <laughs> I'm sorry, all that we think we need to know, right? But... I mean, we're doing the Gospels. We're, I mean, we're, we're going to do it. And, and, and I, I think if you're willing to hear some of the stuff that we're talking about and, and follow this, I think it's actually going to help you in your overall understanding of things that are going on in the Scriptures, especially the New Testament. So, all right, well, if you don't have anything, I don't have anything. We're pretty much at the end of the time, so let's get out of here. Okie dokie. Oh! Thank you for listening to the Okie Dokie Most Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And be sure to leave us a rating and a review to let us know how this content is impacting your life. You can find out more information about the podcast at www.okidokimos.com. And if you'd like to get a hold of us, please send us an email at okidokimos at gmail.com. And until next time, we pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We'll talk to you again soon.